our fifth panel focuses on the structural chemistry and pharmacological effects of synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, our panelists are Dr. Jordan Trekkie, Dr. Daniel Willenberg, and Dr. Michael Gatch. Uh, Dr. Trekkie is a pharmacologist in the drug and chemical evaluation section of the Diversion Control Division of the Drug Enforcement Administration. He serves as a technical consultant and expert witness for issues related to the Controlled Substances Act and new psychoactive substances. Um, Dr. Trekkie has provided expert testimony in numerous federal hearings regarding pharmacology of controlled substances not referenced in the sentencing guidelines, as well as for federal prosecutions under the Controlled Substances Analog Act. Dr. Trekkie earned his Ph.D. in pharmacology from Temple University and received his postdoctoral training at the Georgetown University School of Medicine. He also worked for the Environmental Protection Agency as a neuropharmacologist and neurotoxicologist. Dr. Willenbring is a drug science specialist in the Drug and Chemical Evaluation Section of the Drug Control Division of the Drug Enforcement Administration. He serves as a technical consultant and expert witness for issues related to the Controlled Substances Act and novel psychoactive substances. Uh, Dr. Willenbring has provided expert testimony in numerous federal hearings regarding the chemical structure of controlled substances not referenced in the sentencing guidelines, as well as for federal prosecutions under the Controlled Substances Analog. Dr. Willingbring earned his Ph.D. in chemistry from the University of California at Davis. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Pittsburgh, funded by the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Gatch is an assistant professor of biomedical sciences at the University of North Texas Health Sciences Center at Fort Worth. At Fort Worth. He has been with the University of North Texas since 1996, serving as a research assistant professor until assuming his current title in 2013. Dr. Gatch focuses his research on preclinical models of drug abuse in particular the development of medications for the treatment of psychostimulant addiction. Dr. Gatch earned his Ph.D. in psychology from Utah State University, his Master of Arts in Behavioral Science from the University of Houston, and his Bachelor of Arts in Behavioral Science from the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Trekkie. Good morning, Judge Pryor and members of the Sentencing Commission. My name is Dr. Jordan Trekkie, and I am a pharmacologist in the Drug and Chemical Evaluation Section within the Diversion Control Division of the DEA. My primary responsibility within the division is to evaluate various drugs for their pharmacological effects in relation to the Controlled Substances Act. In addition, I have served as an expert witness for the government in over 40 federal court proceedings involving controlled substance analogs and the sentencing of these substances. Thank you for the opportunity to briefly discuss the pharmacology of synthetic cannabinoids. Synthetic cannabinoids represent a subclass of drugs commonly referred to as new psychoactive substances, or NPS. The abuse of synthetic cannabinoids has been shown to cause serious adverse effects, including excited delirium, agitation, seizures, hyperemesis syndrome, cardiac arrest, multi-organ failure, and death. These drugs are trafficked to youth, those in drug rehab facilities, the homeless, users attempting to evade a positive drug screen, and many other demographics and age groups. Illicit manufacturers of synthetic cannabinoids continue to make small chemical modifications while retaining the pharmacological effects users seek in an attempt to avoid law enforcement detection. Many of the synthetic cannabinoids available on the illicit market were originally designed by legitimate pharmaceutical researchers with the positive goal of finding new therapeutic drugs and targets to alleviate disease symptoms. However, illicit manufacturers have mined the patent and scientific literature for structures with potential psychoactive effects 
thereby giving clandestine laboratories the blueprints to produce hundreds of synthetic cannabinoids for supplying the illicit market. Thousands of new compounds are likely to be produced and subsequently introduced to unsuspecting users. The synthetic cannabinoids encountered on the illicit market are predominantly potent, full cannabinoid receptor agonists that are pharmacologically similar to the partial agonist THC. Synthetic cannabinoids like THC bind to and activate the CB1 receptor while producing euphoric and hallucinogenic effects. Synthetic cannabinoids represent a group of substances with a common, common pharmacological property, activation of the CB1 cannabinoid receptor. A synthetic cannabinoid should be defined as a substance that acts as an agonist at the CB1 receptor. Widespread overdose clusters and individual deaths across the country have grown in number and severity since the first United States reports in 2010 and 2011. Marketed with street names including synthetic marijuana, spice, K2, mojo, and others, manufacturers lace an inert plant material with a synthetic cannabinoid while dealers push users into assuming <laughs> the effects are similar to marijuana. The consequences of ingesting these chemicals is a pathway to addiction with debilitating and often long-lasting side effects if the user is fortunate enough to live through the experiences. Synthetic cannabinoids continue to demonstrate serious adverse effects across age brackets that greatly surpass those observed with THC. These substances continue to be a threat to public safety, are frequently marketed to and abused by those of a young age, are continue to be illegally imported into the United States, and are mixed with plant material to produce a large number of doses per gram. In our experience, novel synthetic cannabinoids continue to be introduced into the illicit drug market in an attempt to circumvent current drug controls within the United States. Synthetic cannabinoids represent a group of pharmacologically similar substances that are commonly abused by a wide group of individuals with often serious and toxic consequences. From the perspective of a pharmacologist, a class approach for synthetic cannabinoids would offer clarity and consistency. I am hopeful that the Commission adopts a class approach to synthetic cannabinoids, and I look forward to your questions. Dr. Willenberg, great. Good morning, uh, Chair Pryor and distinguished members of the Commission. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to briefly discuss the structural considerations related to synthetic cannabinoids. I've provided testimony in a number of federal cases involving novel psychoactive substances, including synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, since starting at DEA, uh, the majority of my travel around the United States has involved testimony in sentencing hearings, addressing issues related to and objections related to applica application note six, uh, substances not referenced in the guidelines. Um, as you've heard, synthetic cannabinoids represent a class of man-made substances irrespective of their chemical structure that act on specific receptors in the central nervous system. Uh, substances from this class are continuously altered and introduced on the illicit market in an attempt to circumvent the regulatory controls while retaining that THC-like pharmacological effect. Although some of the early uh, synthetic cannabinoids uh, seen on the illicit market did have some structural features in common with THC, most synthetic cannabinoids encountered on the illicit market today uh, do, do not have structural similarity to THC. Uh, many of these substances originate from legitimate research. Uh, re re researchers routinely will publish results from their work um, in patents and peer-reviewed papers, and these publications provide uh, a roadmap or, or instructions for the chemical synthesis of these substances and uh, results from the experiments showing that they are active on that CB1 receptor. So illicit manufacturers mine this pool of hundreds of known synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, increasingly, these same manufacturers will introduce additional chemical modifications not in the peer-reviewed literature and are mixing and matching substitutions from previously uh, uh, published structures. So uh, for brand new substances that have never been uh, produced before. Um, in 2012, Congress passed the Synthetic Drug Abuse Prevention Act, or SIDAPA, to control synthetic cannabinoids based on a two-part definition that includes chemical structure and experiments to show that the substances are CB1 agonists. 
as soon as this public as soon as this legislation was made public uh, before it was signed into law well, substances began appearing on the illicit market that fell outside of the limited structural definitions in SIDAPA but maintained those same effects on the CB1 receptor. Most, uh, but not all, of the synthetic cannabinoids in Schedule 1 are derived from chemicals known as indole or indazole. And moving forward, we expect to see uh, trafficking of additional substances based on these core structures and possibly based on other core structures that are described in the scientific literature. Synthetic cannabinoids on the illicit market are frequently uh, frequently stray from the simple structural definitions uh, that are more suitable for other groups of novel psychoactive substances. As you've heard, however, these synthetic cannabinoids all have at least one thing in common. They are agonists at that CB1 receptor. Uh, we look forward to working with the commission to address how synthetic cannabinoids are treated under the guidelines. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Dr. Gatch. Good morning. I'm honored that I've been asked to testify before this uh, um, commission. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Uh, sorry, Judge Pryor and the members of the commission. Um, I've been for the past eight years or so testing for the DEA a number of these compounds, including hallucinogens, sedative hypnotics, cathinones, uh, cannabinoids, and recently this year starting testing um, synthetic fentanyl derivatives. <laughs> Um, for the focus of this, we're talking about the cannabinoids, and I want to emphasize three points in my written testimony that I sent in. Um, first, as mentioned previously, the cast of compounds labeled cannabinoid is defined based on their function, so including their in vitro activity at various receptors, a number of bioassays such as the tetrad that are used to um, characterize these early compounds, and then various behavioral effects that are used to and their substance abuse liability. The second is that tetrahydrocannabinol, delta-9, is, which is the most prevalent psychoactive compound in marijuana, is likely the most appropriate standard for defining cannabinoid-like effects, given that it is, it is the compound that uh, likely drives the recreational use of marijuana and that most of the synthetic compounds are used as marijuana substitutes. The third point they wanted to emphasize was that despite this clear classification in terms of cannabinoid label, they're not at all homogenous in terms of their potencies, efficacies, their time course, or their side effects. Um, now, all of them produce this well-known set of uh, effects, like the, like the tetrad, and they bind at these receptors, but their potencies at are quite variable. Um, synthetic compounds that I've tested in my lab have about a 300-fold range. So, yeah, so you could pick up someone with a, with a given quantity in, in their pocket that could be three doses or 900. Okay, so the one, this is personal use, the other one is definitely trafficking. Okay. Um, efficacy can also range extensively. Now, the, the bioassays that they use to test these the receptor assays um, can test a really large range of effects, and these synthetic compounds are full, very strong agonists. And we found that marijuana, that THC, is actually a, a fairly weak partial agonist. And in fact, we're finding that in order to produce full effects at these bioassays, or for the abuse liability assays, you only need to activate the receptors a small amount. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> The synthetic cannabinoids have very, very high efficacy, as I mentioned, but this does not make them any more reinforcing or increase their abuse liability. Okay, they sort of hit that threshold, so they're not really any more uh, reinforcing or abuse liability than what THC is. What it does appear to do is to increase their toxic effects. Okay, some of these are mediated by the CB1 and CB2 cannabinoid receptors, though some of them, particularly some of the newer ones, seem to be hitting some other receptor systems. Some of the cardiac effects that are being noticed seem to be through serotonin receptors and other things, but that's very sketchily known right now. Okay. So the plant-based marijuana-like and endogenous cannabinoids have very, very mild adverse effects, mostly. The synthetic cannabinoids are significantly more toxic, and some of them are recently induced synthetics are extremely toxic and even lethal. We've seen waves of when they've been introduced to areas and seen these waves of, um, of deaths 
and increased emergency room visits and such. Okay. Um, and on top of this, the sort of the therapeutic window of these vary. Like when we're talking about the opioids, there's a fairly standard difference between the dose that will produce analgesia and the dose that will produce respiratory depression. And that's fairly consistent among the opioids. That was always one of the holy grails of opioid early research, trying to find one that would produce analgesia at much lower doses than would produce respiratory depression. And it never could. It's always pretty closely locked in. These compounds range greatly. Um, just to give an example um, of some of these varied effects, I had a compound that its effects hit almost instantly. So in the time that I had injected it and put it into the apparatus to test it, the effects were already on, fully on. Okay? The effects were completely gone within 60 minutes, and there were no sign of any kind of adverse effects whatsoever at all. Okay. Another compound I tested, it took two hours for the compound to hit maximal effects. Okay. The effects lasted 48 hours. Okay. Um, most of the rest that we were testing showed some sort of uh, slowing in behaviors from the, the locomotor of depression. It's one of the tetrad. Um, some of them actually showed the uh, rigid body, the catalepsy, and uh, one of them actually was completely rigid and ice cold. Okay. Again, hypothermia is one of the tetrad. So the full adverse effects of the tetrad were already on board at the dose that was necessary in order to produce um, full marijuana-like effects. Um, the, uh, these adverse effects lasted several hours. Um, they were mostly gone within uh, 8 to 10 hours after testing, although the uh, um, subjective marijuana-like effects were present at 24 hours, and I had to test out to 48 hours before I lost those effects. Yeah. So there's an enormous variety, a range of variability in the magnitude of their cannabinoid-like effects in terms of their adverse effects, um, the range of other kind of adverse effects. They had some listings before, and I assume the panel next after us will talk about some of the other uh, medical effects that some of these compounds can produce. So thank you for your uh, um, patience listening to me, and I'm um, ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gatch. Uh, questions? I have a, a question. So if, um, as we think about a class-based approach, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I, I hear the need for that given the fact that you can't keep up with the kind of chemical innovation that the manufacturers have. But at the same time, it sounds like a class, it's a very, it's a variable class in terms of the effects. And so if, in order to distinguish um, who, all the things that are in that class in terms of harm, would that have to be based on dose, on something else, because it, it seems to me that, yes, they have this effect on the body that we could define it as, but that's not really getting at the harms or the kinds of actual physical effects on a human being that might be health-related unless we looked at dose. Is that correct, or is there something that I'm missing in terms of how we would group these things together? I, I would love to hear from any of you on this, because it seems to me that's the, that's the dilemma with this one. If we're not going to use a chemical structure and we're going to say the definition is based on how it affects this cannabinoid receptor, that yes, that would group them all together, but they're actually not alike in all these other fundamental ways. And so I'm trying to figure out how we could kind of mediate those, that tension. Yeah, it has seemed that the really new compounds, the last generation of these compounds are the ones that have been really, really dangerous, that have created these big waves of, uh, of problems in terms of the um, um, emergency room visits and, uh, and deaths and such. So it's possible um, there's some particular structural moieties that are responsible for sort of things, but we don't know that yet. I mean, it'd be sort of like the opioids in which fentanyl is so much more dangerous because that's a specific structural subtype within the functional class of opioids. Because, of course, opioids are defined functionally like the cannabinoids are. They, they get the, the opioid receptors. So, but that, at, at this point, we don't, we haven't had enough pharmacology yet just because we're still sort of, uh, we're not characterizing these compounds in a lab. We're sort of finding them out in the street and in, in the wild as <laughs> and, and characterizing them after the fact. So I don't know if you guys had any the other witnesses have something to add to that? So I think a few points to consider. Um, just to set the stage, to date between Congress and the DEA, there are 33 synthetic cannabinoids listed in Schedule 1. In 2017 alone, uh, DEA has identified over 70 new synthetic cannabinoids on the illicit market. 
uh, Cayman Chemical lists over 700 synthetic cannabinoid standards available that we're aware of. So that demonstrates how many synthetic cannabinoids are currently around the illicit market with thousands waiting in the wings in patents or scientific literature. When we look at the pharmacological effects, the pharmacological effects, not talking about concentration or dose yet, the pharmacological effects are similar. They are all full agonists at the CB1 receptor. When we go into what Dr. Gatch was demonstrating or talking about, there are a few chemicals that have that low potency, lower than THC. One example that comes to mind was RCS4. Uh, in Dr. Gatch's research, it showed 40 times less potent than THC in the drug discrimination assay. Those kind of drugs, though, do not last on the illicit market. Um, RCS4 did show up in a few indictments. I've talked about it in court before. However, the users want that potent, euphoric, strong effect. The drugs that are coming out now quickly displace the ones that are weaker. Uh, when we look at drugs like JWH18 and AM2201, we see three, four, and five-fold more potent than THC. We look at drugs like 5-FADB or 5-FPB22. Now we're in the 15 and 20 times more potent than THC. So the drugs the users want are multifold, and I would personally believe that that's one consideration when you look at the class-based approach. These are all potent substances that the manufacturers can then titrate the dose as they mix the chemical both correctly or incorrectly. Um, the one thing mentioned before, there's no therapeutic dose of this. So while I understand what Dr. Gatch was saying, looking at that window compared to opioids, the substances on, unlike fentanyl, there's no medical use for these substances. And so I do agree that the dose that people want the effect, while that's not a therapeutic in the medical community, it is wide-ranging, it's unpredictable. While one person may have a hyperthermic response, a body warming, Others will have hypothermia. One person has a seizure. One has cardiac arrest. Clearly, the drugs are mostly all more potent than THC. The drugs are intended to give a euphoric response. The pharmacology in that respect is all similar. Where you get the differences are one causes a seizure, one causes multi-organ failure, one causes hyperemesis, and the toxic effects that Dr. Gatch alluded to then have a wide disparity. But in terms of the pharmacology, all these substances are full agonists. Even RCS4 being less potent was still a full agonist. It just took a little more of the drug to get the effects of animals or in humans. I hope that answers your question. It does, although I guess it sounds like we would then need to know about dose for these drugs if we wanted to get the full range, right? If they all have that effect, if they're all full agonists but the effects vary widely in some way, even if you had a class-based approach, though, you would, you would have to go back to this question of dose to really understand. And with that question of dose, we could look to the animal data to look at relative potency, but once again, the manufacturers can always titrate their dose or not even know what chemical they're using. We heard about before, like the fentanyls, just because a person orders XR11 or acryl fentanyl, is that what they ordered? Do they know what they're mixing in the correct amounts? So if we got this perfect dose with all these cannabinoids, it doesn't always translate into what a manufacturer is using or how much a user is using. So I think there's multiple other factors like the trafficking, the young age, that go into this evaluation. Um, we can give dose numbers based upon the animal data as far as possible, but there's a limit to that. Just as one follow-up, you, you said that most, they're mostly more potent than THC, and then you gave some examples of three to five times and then 15 to 20 times, which would you say would be the most common in terms of potency, that first group or the latter group? So the first group is what we saw back in 2010, 11, and 12. So looking There's, back, it would be three to five. Looking now and forward, it would be the higher potencies. The newer substances do have more common 10, 15, 20 times. That doesn't mean that a new drug might not fall into that three to five or that 10 to 20 times less potent as the manufacturers randomly choose these from patent or scientific literature, they may choose one that's less effective. But the trend, perhaps my colleagues would care to opine. They tend, tend to spend to be more potent. It's more, they're more and more potent as the drugs seem to come out. That would stand to reason. Yes. I have a question regarding um, the way in which this drug is applied to the the, sub, the leaves, as I understand it, and uh, whether it is possible 
to take the leafy material that we have seized and determine how much of a cannabinoid is on a particular leaf as we're trying to determine uh, drug quantities. Yeah, I, I can address that. I, I don't work in the laboratory system, but I've spoken with the laboratory system. Um, it would be a tremendous challenge for both our laboratory system and the, the state and local labs to determine how much chemical is actually applied to these leaves. Um, there's a problem with solubility, trying to get the chemical back off the leaf. And then there's also the issue of them having validated methods for every different synthetic cannabinoid. So even if they figured out this problem of dissolving the chemical off the leaf and homogenizing the mixture, um, they would have to redo that whole process for every new substance they encounter. Um, and even if they've done all of that, due to the way that these substances are manufactured, if they open one packet and take a sample of that packet and figure out how much drug is in that particular sample, there's no saying that applies to the rest of the packet or any of the other packets. Um, they use rudimentary techniques to, to manufacture these substances. So um, cement mixers was mentioned. Uh, sometimes they lay out the plant material and they use a garden sprayer, so a pump up type weed sprayers. And they'll put their acetone and drug mixture in there. Um, the most recent trial I testified at, the, the sprayer was too slow, so they started using a watering can. So you can imagine if they're sprinkling this on with a watering can, there's going to be portions of that mixture that have much more drug and portions that have much less drug. And for a laboratory to, to figure that out based on a thousand packets would be a tremendous challenge. My second question relates to something that you were just talking about a moment ago, Dr. Trekkie. If we, we have THC in the guidelines, and if we use THC as a baseline, would you say that the synthetic cannabinoids that you are encountering are more or less dangerous um, than THC? The substances, even the ones that showed lower potency uh, in some of the animal assays, are all substantially more dangerous than THC. Why? Because while the intended effect might be the euphoria, the hallucinations, the adverse effects based upon how potent these substances are and how small of a dose can elicit some of these effects, um, you don't see multi-organ failure, uh, seizures, or death when ingesting THC while THC concentrations in marijuana have increased over the last decade, even the high-dose <clears throat> formulations of the new marijuana strains or some of the edibles, while they'll cause increased paranoia, you're still not seeing even close to the magnitude of adverse effects clinically with these cannabinoids compared to THC. Judge Breyer, do you have any? Uh, yes, uh, for uh, Dr. Datch. Uh, Earlier today, we, we heard a fair amount of testimony about the addictive uh, nature of the uh, of fentanyl uh, and opiates in general. I'm interested in whether you have any opinion as to whether the uh, synthetic uh, drugs that we're talking about now, uh, how that these cannabinoids compare to fentanyl and, and uh, that we've heard earlier in terms of its addictive quality. Okay, so as I understand, you're asking about the synthetic compounds compared to synthetic fentanyl as opposed to uh, the, uh, the THC? No, I was asking about, about uh, fentanyl. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, in general... <laughs> well, I, I think... I Let's make sure we understand this, uh, Judge Breyer. So the question is about the addictive nature of the synthetic cannabinoids in contrast with, say, the addiction, addictiveness of fentanyl. Is that right? That's right. <clears throat> okay. In, if you know. In, in general, the uh, uh, marijuana and the cannabinoids are have less addictive liability than the... Um, uh, they don't have the immediate reinforcing, they don't have the drive to dependence, and they don't have the drive to binging that you typically do with, uh, with, the, um, with, with the opioids or with, um, or particularly with uh, like 
like the psychostimulants, um, you tend to get slower paced sort of use, which tends to, uh, people don't tend to get as addicted as much. And the uh, withdrawal signs are much more mild than they are with, the, with opioids. Um, and notwithstanding, people do get addicted to the, um, and it's, um, to the cannabinoids, whether they're natural or synthetic, and it's still just as difficult to shake it as it is for the opioids. If I could Thank add, you. if I could add one caveat to that, one of this, the adverse effects I discussed was hyperemesis <clears throat> syndrome with the cannabinoids. While the addiction to cannabinoids may not be as severe as addiction to fentanyl, there are in some chronic users of synthetic cannabinoids one of these adverse effects, the hyperemesis syndrome, is that we usually talk about the receptors in the brain because that's where the psychoactive effects occur. But we have to understand the receptors are also located in other parts of the body, one being the intestines and the gut. As you chronically ingest these cannabinoids, you have a hyperstimulation of these other receptors that results in this need to throw up uh, vomit and the only way to alleviate those symptoms are either to smoke the synthetic cannabinoid on the hour, every hour of every day, or one of the other uh, ways to alleviate it is to take a hot shower pretty much all day long. And while that's not physically possible, this is just demonstrates one of the chronic conditions, not a favorable addiction to a drug, not that these drugs are favorable in that sort of sense, but a sort of you get so addicted, you must continue to smoke them every hour of every day just to keep yourself from throwing up. Those are some of the adverse effects that we see from these synthetic cannabinoids because they're so potent. This has been seen with marijuana in extreme chronic users, but with these drugs' potency, it comes on a lot quicker and we're seeing it more common with the synthetic cannabinoid users, um, just like we did with chronic THC users. Thank you. Um, we appreciate your uh, appearance today and providing oral testimony and we appreciate too the written um, materials that you submitted earlier that are part of our record and um, uh, again uh, your your testimony today will be helpful uh, to our work.